Have you ever watched an adaptation of a piece of media you like that made total sense to you but not to your friends who aren't as knowledgeable about the source material? It's possible that certain key information was left out and you just didn't notice. I discussed this to an extent back in the Resident Evil episode. You know, Las Plagas showing up as if it was a T-virus thing, lines of dialogue ripped from Resi 5 without the context that justified the line, stuff like that. So for this one, let's instead focus on other adaptations. Primarily, of course, Mortal Kombat. In the first MK movie, Liu Kang challenges Shang Tsung with this line. I am Liu Kang, descendant of Kung Lao. Consider, at what point did the movie explain who Kung Lao is? When did the movie establish that Kung Lao once beat Shang Tsung and then lost to Goro? This line only holds significance if you're familiar with the games where he's important to the backstory of the tournament or retroactively after they made a TV prequel that starred Kung Lao. Otherwise, you're left wondering why anyone should care who Liu Kang's ancestor is. Must be a Chinese thing, says the average viewer. This happens more often than you'd expect in adaptations, but you might not notice it if you already have the context in your head from the source material. A character might have certain knowledge or a certain item that goes unexplained in the movie, but because you've read the book or played the game, your brain automatically fills in the blanks and makes the viewing experience more cohesive. A non-MK example would be that the Harry Potter movies never explained who the Marauders were, despite their map being an important plot point. These films had quite a few of these as they went on, but given how big HP was at the time, it's a fair bet that most of the audience would have read or been read the books. Similar to how newer Spider-Man media assumes you're familiar with his origin since it's so ingrained into the public consciousness by this point. For cases like this, it can be acceptable, but for something that's not a mega hit, you really can't do that. The perfect example of this is the Yakuza movie by Takashi Miike, which does very little to explain the central narrative. It features some scenes from the game, but the setup just isn't there. Nishiki, the final boss and blood brother of our lead isn't even mentioned until about five minutes before the final showdown. Why Kiryu wants to fight him, what Nishiki's motivation is, what Kiryu's relationship with Date is, what Kiryu's relationship with Yumi is, why Yumi wants to kill Jingu, Majima's reason for hunting Kiryu, none of this is ever properly explained. You can follow along easily enough if you know the story of the game, but without that knowledge, none of this has any justification and is just a series of random disconnected scenes. But this can even happen within the core series, like how Halo 5 expect you to know who Blue Team from the books are despite them never having even been mentioned prior to this. I'm also told that Transformers The Last Knight did this with Unicron and the Knights of Cybertron, giving little to no explanation and expecting you to be familiar with them already. But back to MK, specifically MK Annihilation. Sub-Zero saves Liu Kang and Katana from Smoke. He explains that... Two days ago, Khan reprogrammed Smoke to come after you instead of me. Who this robot man is and why he might be after Sub-Zero are never explained. Nor is the reason why there's a yellow version of him in another scene going after Jax and Sonya. Game fans know that Smoke and Cyrax are Sub-Zero's fellow Lin Kuei who became part of the Cyber Initiative and now hunt down escapees, but the Lin Kuei itself is never mentioned in the films, never mind the Cyber Initiative, nor is it explained how the feudalistic Outworld Khan would know how to reprogram a machine when his usual tech expert Kano is already dead here. Speaking of Khan, his reveal of his name in Star Trek Into Darkness is treated like a big deal by the film with emphasis placed by Cumberbatch and a dramatic pause that only exists for people who know who the Khan in Wrath of Khan is, even though in this new timeline he has done nothing of note and Jim has no reason to give a shit who he is. When Sub-Zero has his fight with Scorpion, while it's cool to see the two fight on the big screen, there's no history between them here. Scorpion's history with Bi-Han was only alluded to with a blink and you'll miss it line from Shang Tsung in the first film, and Scorpion didn't even kill Bi-Han in this universe, Liu Kang did. So even if Bi-Han and Scorpion actually had a properly established rivalry before this point, Kuai Liang fighting Scorpion wouldn't really mean anything. It only holds weight because they're rivals in the source material, or retroactively with Scorpion's feud with Sub-Zero's ancestor in Conquest. If anything, a fight between Sub-Zero and Liu Kang would be more interesting here, but still not as interesting as a fully adapted Scorpion and Sub-Zero would. Legends had one fucking job and they gave Sub-Zero like four minutes of screen time. It kind of reminds me of the production IG anime adaptation of Sengoku Basara. In the games, Tokugawa Ieyasu kills Toyotomi Hideyoshi, leading Ishida Mitsunari to raise an army to kill Ieyasu. In the anime, it's Date Masamune who kills Hideyoshi, leading to a feud between Mitsunari and Masamune instead. But this version isn't as interesting because Mitsunari and Ieyasu were friends while they served Hideyoshi, so the grudge is more personal for Mitsunari. He and Masamune don't know each other before this. Ieyasu doesn't actually want to kill Mitsunari. Masamune relishes a fight. Mitsunari 
Yoshinari becomes an empty shell if he manages to kill his old friend. Obviously wouldn't happen if he killed Masamune. Ieyasu doesn't fare much better in the opposite. Masamune would be fine. And the Sun vs Moon symbolism is swapped for Dragon or Lightning vs Moon. Even leaving aside the difference in length, the end of Judgment anime, which retold the story in a manner more in line with the games, was more interesting because of this central dynamic that the last party version lacked. Another instance of key context being left out is with Melina, who was originally going to be the sole focus of this video before I noticed more examples. In the movie, Melina ambushes Sonya in a desert. We get this exchange, Katana, you wish. and then the two fight. For a fan of the games, this makes perfect sense. Melina is a clone of Katana, only distinguishable by her colour scheme and her mouth. With knowledge of Melina's origins from the games, it makes total sense that Sonya would mistake Melina for Katana, so long as her mouth is covered. But the movie never bothers to establish her status as a clone. In the movie, Sonya sees a masked woman who doesn't really dress like Katana and isn't even played by the same actress for close-ups, and she still thinks it's Katana. I mean, Katana and Melina never share a scene together, so split screens and green screens didn't need to be considered in casting, and Talisa Soto was one of only three actors to return from the first film, one of two playing the same character, so there's no reason at all to not have her play Melina for close-ups and her speaking lines before switching to a masked stunt double for the fight scene. It's quite similar to the scene in MK2011 where Smoke finds Jade standing over the unconscious Melina and thinks Jade beat up Katana despite there being absolutely no reason to think they're the same person given how the only similarities are raven hair and big boobs. Even the skin tones don't match, but Smoke still thinks it's Katana. If I were to wasted potential this thing, I'd have Melina, betrayed by Soto, take Jade's role as the traitor, posing as Katana to infiltrate the heroes and betray them at a key moment. She could begin the infiltration after losing to Sonya, claiming she was mind controlled like her mother to excuse the fight. Then Sindel, Khan or Katana explains Melina's origins when they reach Sindel. Come on guys, this is easy. One could argue that a story arc being condensed down to only its bare essentials or barely being noticeable to one not familiar with the source material counts as this too, such as MK Legend Scorpion's Revenge's half-assed setup for the Johnny Cage and Sonya Blade relationship. She hates him throughout the film, he helps her escape captivity from a group of monsters and proves that he can fight, and suddenly she's starting to fall for him. Trash! Can you think of any more examples of this? I'm also curious to see if anyone has an example of the opposite, an adaptation adding details that fill in the blanks for them in the source material. Maybe you consider Kano killing Sonya's partner to justify her hatred of him from the first film to be this. Of course, that kind of expansion of the story can cause its own unique set of problems, which I'll be discussing in a future episode when we discuss SD Perry's Resident Evil series. And I will talk about the mess of altered and removed context that was the Negima anime adaptation, but that's getting its own dedicated episode because what they did to the Kyoto arc was a fucking disgrace. If you liked this video, why not subscribe and support me on Patreon like these fine people here? If not, then make sure to share it with your enemies so they can suffer along with you. Today's recommended playlist is the Harry Potterathon by Dominic Noble. It's part of his show Lost in Adaptation where he discusses movies based on books, and this subject comes up quite a bit as the Potterathon goes on. 